Howdy folks, it's Mr. Ryan and what we're going to do in this video is we are going to talk about the properties of limits. Now I'm assuming at this point that you have probably already uh, learned how to solve a basic limit uh, either with a calculator, uh, preferably analytically uh, through factoring or with synthetic division or something like that. Uh, and what I want to do now is I want to uh, I want to explain that there are ways that limits uh, interact with one another or interact with other mathematical elements, and um, these properties of limits are actually very simple. They're very easy to understand. All of them uh, operate exactly how you think that they would operate, so uh, they're very intuitive. Uh, but and so then someone might say, well, then what's the purpose in even spending time on the properties of limits. Uh, well, the reason we're going to spend time on properties of limits is that when you get to higher levels of understanding in calculus and in other areas of math, uh, the properties of limits become important parts of proofs and things like that. Okay, so um, there is a traditional way that math books explain the properties of limits. Uh, you could very easily go on Khan Academy and find uh, an explanation uh, about the properties of limits, uh, the kind that you would see in a textbook. Um, and I'll sort of touch on those ways, but the purpose of this video is not to explain to you the textbook way to understand the properties of limits. I want to give you a more practical uh, set of examples for doing the properties of limits. Uh, they use a lot of letters. Uh, in, in the technical mathematical definitions of the properties of limits. And I want to really give you some actual problems as examples instead of using letters. Okay? Uh, so he, there are, well, there are probably more than this, and it depends on who you are or who the math instructor is as to how many properties there are. But I'm going to give you seven properties of limits. Uh, you can see them all over here, and we'll start with the first one. The first one is the property of limits uh, um, using a con where the function itself is a constant. So when we say a constant, we're referring to a number that does not have a variable in it. For example, we may have a function that says f of x is equal to 5. You know, And if we were to graph this function, f of x is equal to 5, it would be a horizontal line at 5. So, you know, one, two, three, four, five, there's five. And this would just simply be a horizontal line at five because no matter what the x value is, the output is always going to be five. So if x is zero, the output is five. If x is one, the output is five. If x is two, the output is five. No matter what, no matter what the x value is, no matter what the input is, the output is automatically five. And therefore, if we were to then say, what is the limit, what is the limit of the function five as x approaches, let's say, three, so as x is approaching 3, so here, 1, 2, 3, right? As x is approaching 3 from the left and as x is approaching 3 from the right, we have this point right here on the function 5, what is the height of the function? Well, the height is 5, and therefore the limit of 5 as x approaches 3 is 5. So basically when, you're do when, you're, when the uh, limiting function here is a constant, the answer is just the constant. Okay? Uh, that, is, um, that is the property uh, of a constant. And there's not really anything else to say other than that. So let's just give you a few examples here. Uh, what is the limit of negative 10 as x approaches 0? Well, it's negative 10. Okay, good. What is the limit? of 17 as x approaches negative 2. Well, the limit of 17 as x approaches negative 2 is 17. Okay, uh, well I, I guess uh, two examples that's probably good enough. Uh, but that's basically the property of constants. Okay, so we're good on that property. Let's move on to the next property. Let's move on to the scalar property of limits. 
So a scalar, if, you're not, if you don't already know this, is basically a constant multiplier. Okay? So if I take 7x, if I take the function 7x and I multiply it by 3, multiply by 3, I get 21x, right? Well, this variable term is being multiplied by a constant. That constant is a scalar. Now, here's what's really interesting. Do you see this 7x? I mean, even that function, the x is the variable portion. Guess what that 7 is doing to the x? It's scaling it up by 7. And so that 7 itself is a scalar. So coefficients themselves are scalars. Okay. So what we have here when we say a scalar is you've seen what is the limit as x approaches 3 of um, you know, x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. And we know that to solve this limit, uh, we can factor the numerator that this would become the limit as x approaches 3 of x minus 3 times x plus 3 over x minus 3, right? And then we know that the, that the x minus 3s would now cancel and that we would now plug the 3 in for the x up here and 3 plus 3 is 6. And so the, the limit here is 6. Well, what if I had the same limit but, it was, but, that, the, but this function right here was being multiplied by a scalar? What if I had the limit as x approaches 3 of um, 4 times x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. Let's say that this was now our limit. Okay, So we're multiplying our function by a scalar. We're scaling it up by 4. Okay, Well, this is basically it's going to be the same thing as the limit as x approaches 3 of 4 times the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. Okay, So basically, the limit of the product of the scalar and the function is the product of the limit of the scalar times the limit of the function. Well, didn't we just do this problem right here a few minutes ago? That's a constant, isn't it? The lim what is the limit as x approaches 3 of 4? It's 4, right? So this is going to equal, this limit is going to equal 4 times this limit right here we already said is equal to 3 because we factor this and cancel the x minus 3, so this is 6. So the answer to this is going to be 24. So all you really have to do when you're doing the limit that includes a scalar is first just find your regular limit, ignore the scalar, find the limit of the function, then multiply that limit 6 times 4 to get your answer, which, is, which in this case is 24. Okay, I think we should do one more example. I know you think we should do one more example too. I know you're thinking that. Okay, so let's see here. Let's do, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this limit up and then I want you to pause the video and try it yourself, then see if you got the same answer that I did. So let's say that we have the limit as x approaches um, uh, 6 of, uh, let's say, 5 times x squared minus 36 over x minus 6. Okay, so there's your limit, and why don't you go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Alright, so now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply so identify the limit of this right here. So I want to know what is the limit as x approaches 6 of x squared minus 36 over x minus 6. Now we know that this numerator is can be um, factored, so we're going to do the limit as x approaches 6 of x minus 6 times x plus 6 all over x minus 6. That's a ugly looking x minus 6, but that's what it is. And now here, this is the x minus 6s are going to cancel. We're going to plug the 6 in here, and 6 plus 6 is 12, right? 
So we know that the answer to this part is 12. So all we have to do is multiply that 12 times the 5. And what is 5 times 12? Well, that's 60. Okay. So, um, so that is the property of scalars. Okay. Let's move on to the property of the, uh, the sum or difference of two limits. Okay. Uh, or not two limits, the sum or difference of two functions. So let's say now that we're going to have, let's say that we have the limit as x approaches uh, 2. The limit as x approaches 2. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two functions inside of here, and I'm going to add them together. So let's say that we have the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 plus, now let's see here, uh, plus the function x plus 5. All right, there we go. So we have two functions here. I'll put parentheses around this. So what we have here is we have uh, the limit of this big monster ugly thing of a function plus a function, right? Now, what you would want to do is exactly what you're supposed to do. And here's what I'm going to say, is that the limit of the sum is the same as the sum of the limits. I'm going to write this out in sort of technical mathematical uh, terms the way you would see in a textbook. It would say this, that the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus g of x. So if you have the limit as x approaches this a, that's a constant. That's just a number like 2 or 5 or negative 7 okay, or 0. So we have the limit and then of this complex thing, which is a function plus a function. Well, that's going to be the same thing as the sum of two different limits. I could just as easily say the limit as x approaches a of f of x plus the limit as x approaches a of g of x. All this is saying, all this is saying is all you have to do is find the limit of f of x as x approaches a. That's going to be an answer, a number, hopefully, as long as it's not, you know, no limit. As long as it's a limit, it's a number, then, we, then it works. If it says no limit, then it's no limit for the whole thing. Okay, so, but the limit as x approaches a of f of x, that's going to be a number. We're going to set that aside. Then we're going to do the same thing to g of x. The limit as x approaches a of g of x, that's going to be another number. And then you're just going to add those two numbers together. That's all you have to do. So, so what this is going to be up here is, this would be the same thing as the limit as x approaches 2 of this, plus, set that aside, the limit as x approaches 2 of this then add those two numbers together. So let's do that. What is the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2? Well, let's, let's do that on the side. I'm going I'm to erase this, so hopefully you wrote that down if you, if you need it for your notes, if it helps you. you know, your notes are your notes, okay? Your notes are your notes. So, um, so just write down whatever you think you need to understand. So I'm going to do this, the limit of this, kind of on the side. The limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 4 over x minus 2, right? And that's going to be, um, you know, we can factor this. The limit as x approaches 2 of, we're going to have x plus 2 times x minus 2 all over x minus 2, right? Um, and that this is going to be, that we're going to cancel the x minus 2s and now plug the 2 and then 2 plus 2 is 4. So the answer to this is 4. So the limit of this is 4 plus, now we just need the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 5. Well, we know that all we have to do is plug the 2 in for x. This one's not complicated. We just put a 2 in there and 2 plus 5 is 7. And so 4 plus 7, that's 11. There we go. 
So we just did two separate limits and then we added them together and that is the sum, uh, that is the limit of a sum of two functions. We could do the exact same thing with subtraction. If this had said instead, let's say that this said the limit as x approaches 2 of this function minus, minus this function. Well, then we would just find the limit of this function, which is 4, and then we would subtract, and then we would find the limit of this function, which is 7, and 4 minus 7, that's negative 3. And that is the sum and difference property. I think we should do another example. I'm going to make it a little harder one, just so you can practice your limits and also practice the property of limits, okay? So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's say that we're going to do uh, the limit as x approaches 3 of, let's say, uh, um, we're going to put x squared um, minus 8x plus 15 over x minus 3 plus uh, x squared minus, oh goodness, x, x squared minus x minus 6 all over uh, x Let's say x minus 3 again, although this is, you know, you could just simply add the two numerators together because we have a common denominator, but we're going to do it separately here. I could have made this a little more complicated, but I really didn't want to make it more complicated, not right now, okay? So we have the limit of a function plus a function. So all we have to do is find the limit of this thing and write that down. Well, actually, we could write it over here, okay? So what is the limit of this as x approaches 3? Okay, so the limit as x approaches 3, uh, I'm going to factor the numerator here, and that's going to factor into x minus 3 times x minus 5, okay? Because negative 5 times negative 3 is 15, and negative 5 plus negative 3 is negative 8. And then over x minus 3, okay? Now we're going to cancel the x minus 3s, and we plug the 3 in, and 3 minus 5, that's negative 2. Okay, so we know that the limit of this as x approaches 3 is negative 2. So we're going to write that down over here. Then we're going to put a plus, and I'll put this in parentheses because it's a negative number. I like to put negative numbers in parentheses. It helps remind me that I'm supposed to do something with the negative sign. Um, so now let's do the limit of this, this one right here. Okay, we'll do that uh, maybe down here. We'll go to the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 all over x minus 3, right? Now we're going to factor the numerator. Uh, two numbers that multiply to negative 6 but add up to negative 1 in front of that x are negative 3 and positive 2. And so we're going to have x minus, oops, excuse me, I need to put my limit in there. The limit as x approaches 3 of, and we're going to have x minus 3 times x plus 2 over x minus 3, and that's going to cancel the x minus 3's, leave us with an x plus 2 and 3 plus 2, well that's 5. So now it's negative 2 plus 5, and negative 2 plus 5 is 3. So the limit as x approaches 3 of this thing is equal to 3. Now the fact that the answer wound up being the same as the x approaches number, that's total coincidence. Okay, that's coincidence. Don't think that you ever take this number and put it over here as an answer arbitrarily. Okay, if this was a negative, if this said minus, then we would just instead subtract these two numbers and we'd have negative 2 minus 5, which would be negative 7. And so that is the sum and difference property of limits. Okay, so we're good there. Let's move on to the product property of limits. Well, the product property, the, you know, remember product means multiply. The product property of limits is exactly the same as what you think it would be. So if we had um, the limit 
if we had the limit as x approaches negative 4 of, let's say we have um, uh, x squared, in fact, we're going to put a big bracket here, um, x squared, let's see here, um, yeah, there we go, plus 6x plus 8 over uh, x plus 4 times, okay, so we're going to put the little middle dot there for, for multiplying, times um, uh, x plus 7, okay, let's just make it kind of simple. Uh, so what we have here is we have a limit as x approaches negative 4 of a function times another function. Now you could multiply this function times the numerator and then do the limit, but that could be really complicated and annoying. Okay. Instead what you can do is this, is the limit of the product is the same as the product of the separate limits. So again, just like with adding and subtracting, all you have to do is find the limit of the first thing, get the number, find the limit of the second thing, get the number, and then multiply those two numbers together, and that'll give your, you your overall limit of the product. Uh, in technical language, it would look like this. If we said the limit as x approaches a of f of x times g of x, so the limit of the product of two functions is equal to the product of the two limits. We would do the limit as x approaches a of f of x times the limit as x approaches a of g of x. You would just find the two individual limits and you would multiply them together. And that's what we're going to do up here. Why don't, now, I think that you should pause the video and you should try to find these two limits separately on your own, then multiply them and see if you got what I got. Okay, so let me erase this and now we're going to work this out. So I need two separate limits. I need the limit as x approaches negative 4 of this thing. So I have the limit as x approaches negative 4 of, I'm going to factor the numerator, two numbers that multiply to positive 8 and add up to positive 6 are positive 2 and positive 4. And so that's going to be x plus 2 times x plus 4 all over x plus 4. And of course, we're going to cancel the x plus 4. Now, I want you to understand that really the first step, I'm trying to save time here. Okay, I'm trying to save time. Now, really, your first step up here, and I want to remind you of this, is that you have to put the negative 4 in for x here, here, and here. You have to substitute first before you move on to factoring. Okay, But I already set these up, and I already know that they're going to be equal to 0 over 0. Okay, I just, just, I'm trying to save some time. Okay, So i got an x plus 4 and x plus 2, can, 4, cancel those out. Now I'm going to plug the negative 4 in for x, and negative 4 plus 2 is negative 2. So I know that the limit as x approaches negative 4 of this function is negative 2. So I'm going to put negative 2 in parentheses here. Times. So I'm going to put times. And now I need to know the limit as x approaches negative 4 of x plus 7. Well, this one's easy. I just plug the negative 4 in, and negative 4 plus 7 is 3. So I'm going to put a 3 here. And negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. So I hope that that's what you got as your answer. And so the property, the multiplication, the product property of limits basically just says find the two separate limits and then multiply those two numbers together. Okay? It's going to be the same thing for quotients, exact same thing, but we have a tiny, tiny rule that's important to understand for quotients. So let's say that we have the limit as x approaches, uh, I don't know, as x approaches 1 of, and we're going to make this thing kind of complicated, let's say the numerator is, um, is, I don't know, 2 to the x power. That'll be fun. We haven't done an exponent yet. Let's say 2 to the x power. It's also really easy to do this one in particular. 
Okay, so the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 to the x power over, now the denominator, see we're going to make this a complex fraction. Uh, we're going to say x squared minus 1. Let's, yeah, let's make this one. Let's make it look complicated, but it's actually not complicated over x minus 1. Okay, all right, so here is our limit. And if you saw this, the, just the first time you saw this, you would be probably annoyed and a little freaked out, and you'd be like, that's weird, that doesn't look like anything I've done before. Um, but it's really easy. So here's what we're going to say. The limit as x approaches 1 of the quotient of two functions is the same thing as the quotient of the limits. As long as, as long as, this is hugely important, as long as the limit of the denominator is not equal to zero. Because remember, rule in math, we are not allowed to divide by zero. That is a major rule in math. We're never allowed to divide by zero. Anytime we're being asked to divide by zero, it's either undefined or it's something that we have to do more work on. Okay, so the denominator is not, the limit of the denominator is not allowed to be zero. So as long as the limit of the denominator is not zero, then the rule is just do the limit of the numerator, get a number, do the limit of the denominator, get a number, and then make a fraction and reduce it if you can. So now, so really what this is going to become is it's going to become the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 to the x power over the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. And we know how to do these two problems. Now it's very easy. Now that we've turned it into a limit divided by a limit, it's now something that we're able to do, that we remember, or that it's, it's within the scope of what we have already learned how to do. Okay? And so now we just do the limit as x approaches 1 of 2 to the x power. Well, remember, our first rule of solving limits is to plug the x approaches number in for x. So we'll put a 1 in here. And what is 2 to the first power? Well, it's 2. So we're going to have a 2 in the numerator. And what's the limit of the denominator here? Well, let's do this on the side. We'll have the limit as x approaches 1 of, we're going to factor the numerator. That's going to become x minus 1 times x plus 1 over x minus 1. Now we're going to cancel the x minus 1s, right? And now all we have left, excuse me, is x plus 1. Plug the 1 in and 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. So the denominator here is 2, and so our answer is 2 over 2, which is 1. So our answer is 1, okay? Uh, this is, this one in particular is extremely important in calculus, especially if you move on to calculus 2, okay? So that is the property of quotients. And I can show you the, the technical definition, which goes the limit as x approaches a of f of x over g of x is equal to the limit as x approaches a of f of x divided by the limit as x approaches a of g of x as long as uh, the as long as the limit as x approaches a of g of x does not equal zero. As long as the limit um, of, of g of x as x approaches a, as long as this does not equal zero, then you're a go for this, okay? All right, why don't you try this one? Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure this one out. This one down here, this denominator, when you do the limit of that, you're probably going to need to use synthetic division or something like that. All right, let's see here. So we've got the limit as x approaches negative 3 of the numerator, which is 5x plus 29. That limit is really easy. All we have to do to do the limit of this thing is plug the negative 3 in. Negative 3 times 5, that's negative 15 plus 29, that's 14. So we know that this is going to be 14 over. Now we need to do the limit of this thing on the bottom. 
So we've got to find the limit as x approaches negative 3 of uh, 2x cubed plus 17x squared plus 41x plus 24 over x plus 3. Now we know that if we put a negative 3 in the denominator that it's going to be 0. But let's go ahead and put the negative 3 into the numerator and just see if it's 0 or not 0. Well, negative 3 cubed, that's negative 27 times 2 is negative 54. Uh, negative 3 squared is 9. 9 times 17 is 90 and 63 is 153. So we got plus 153. Uh, negative 3 times 41, that's negative 123. And then we're going to add 24. So if we add these together, negative 54 plus 153, that's 99. Minus 123 is uh, negative 24, and then plus 24 is 0. So sure enough, we have 0 over 0, which means we're going to have to use synthetic division to factor the numerator. What we're trying to take out of the numerator is an x plus 3, because we want to cancel this x plus 3 at the bottom. So we want to put negative 3 into the half box. Then we'll put a 2, then a 17, then a 41, and then a 24. We'll draw our line. I like to put a 0 here. 2 plus 0 is 2. Now remember, we want to come up with a 0 as the remainder, so be looking out for that. Negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. 17 plus negative 6 is 11. 11 times negative 3 is negative 33. Negative 33 plus 41, that's 8. And 8 times negative 3 is negative 24. And so sure enough, we have a remainder of 0. 24 and negative 24 is 0. So what we now have left over is 2x squared 2x squared plus 11x plus 8. Okay, So this now, this thing, this limit now becomes the limit as x approaches negative 3 of this 2x squared plus 11x plus 8 times x plus 3, because that's what we divided out with the synthetic division. And then we have x plus 3 in the denominator. Now the x plus 3's are going to cancel, and all we have left is whatever's up here. So we're going to plug the negative 3 in. Negative 3 squared is 9. 9 times 2 is 18. Negative 3 times 11 is minus 33. And, negative th and, then, and then just plus 8. So 18 minus 33, that's, let's see, that's negative 15. And negative 15 plus 8, that's negative 7. So the denominator, the limit, as x approaches negative 3 of the denominator is negative 7. So now we have the limit of the top, 14, divided by the limit of the bottom, negative 7, and that becomes negative 2. And so the limit of this crazy-looking complex fraction is negative 2. And that is the quotient, that is the quotient property of limits. Okay, now let's do the uh, exponent property of limits. The exponent property of limits, which is pretty easy. It's just like the quotient, just like the product. Uh, let's say that we have the limit as x approaches 7 of x squared minus 49 over x minus 7. I'm trying to do really easy limits so that we don't put um, so much emphasis on solving limits and more emphasis on the properties themselves. I really want you to see how easy the properties are. Okay, uh, And I'm sorry, I wanted to change this a little bit. Uh, actually, no, let's do this. Let's put a bracket here. We'll do this and we're going to square the whole function. Now this particular property is very important for if you're moving in, you're going to be moving into calculus too. Okay, so uh, so B especially it's an easy property. You just have to have to pay attention here. So if we want the limit as x approaches seven of a function squared, okay, as long as it's the square of the whole function, okay. This is going to be the same thing as the square of the limit. All you have to do here is find, ignore the exponent for a minute, find the limit of the function, then square that answer. Okay. So basically what's, what we're going to do here is we're going to find the limit as x approaches 7 of x squared minus 49 over x minus 7. Then once we have that answer, 
Once we have that answer, the limit itself, then we're going to square the limit. That's all we have to do here. Okay? This is the, so the, the limit of the square is equal to the square of the limit. The limit of the square is equal to the square of the limit. Well, what is this limit right here? Well, let's factor this up here. We're going to have x minus 7 times x plus 7 over x minus 7, right? And it's the limit as x approaches 7, okay? And so now we're going to cancel out the x minus 7s, okay? And if we go back, if we plugged our 7 in, 7 squared is 49. 49 minus 49 is 0. Plug the 7 in here, 7 minus 7 is 0, and we have 0 over 0. That's why I'm factoring. Now all we have left is x plus 7, so we plug the 7 in, and we get 7 plus 7 is 14. And so this is basically equal to 14 and then squared. So whatever 14 squared is, which is 196. Okay. Um, so the, the limit of this is 196. Let's do another maybe really easy example. One that's maybe even easier than this. What if I said, what is the limit as x approaches negative 9 of the function x plus uh, 13 cubed. cubed. See, it doesn't have to be a square. It can be any exponent. What is the limit as x approaches negative 9 of x plus 13 cubed? Okay, well, all we have to do is... Um, Put the, or this is, is find the limit of this thing, negative 9 plus 13, that's 4, so that's going to be 4 cubed, and so 4 cubed, that's 64, and so the limit of this function is 64, okay? And you don't have to cube this thing and make it look like a giant polynomial and plug the negative 9 in. You don't have to do that, okay? Um, although there is an easier way to solve this, I guess. It's pretty much the same thing. Uh, all right, let's move on to our final, our last property here. Now, you may be looking at the video and saying, hey, Mr. Ryan, there's still a lot of time left in this video. How can this possibly be the last one? Either it's really hard or something else is going on. Well, that's true. After we finish learning these properties, I'm going to show you another way of solving these properties, another way of working with these properties, okay? All right, so we're going to do the radical uh, property. Let's say, what is the limit as x approaches, uh, what is the limit? Hmm. Yeah, that's it. The limit as x approaches 8 of the square root of x squared minus 64 over x minus 8. Okay, so we want to know the limit of this. And so here's what we have. We have a limit of a radical. A limit of a radical. Well, the limit of a radical is equal to the radical of the limit. What you can basically do is just ignore the radical, do the limit of this thing, and then put the radical back on. So basically, we can just do the square root of the limit. The square root of the limit as x approaches 8 of x squared minus 64 over x minus 8. So all we have to do is solve the limit first, then take the square root of it. And the limit here is going to be, let's see, the limit as x approaches 8. If we were to plug the 8 in, 8 squared is 64 minus 64 is 0. 8 uh, minus 8 is 0, so we have 0 over 0. And so we're going to factor the numerator, which will become x minus 8 times x plus 8, all over x minus 8. And now we'll cancel the x minus 8s. And now we're going to plug the 8 in. And 8 plus 8 is equal to 16. So this limit is 16. So what we're looking for is the square root of 16, which is 4. And so that is the radical property of limits. Okay? Um, all right. What we're going to do now is this. Is I'm going to get a note, some notes here. And what I'm going to show you is uh, the, sometimes you'll see this sort of problem. Like if you're taking AP Calculus, 
Uh, they like to do the kind of problems that I'm about to show you. And if you're my student, you're definitely going to see the kind of problems that I'm about to show you on a quiz and also on the exam. Is you'll be given a bunch of uh, answers to limits that are not specified analytically. You'll have like the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x is equal to 9. And then you'll be told that the limit as x approaches negative 2. Now, they'll always be to the same approaches. You'll have the same approaches number. The limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x is negative 7. And then you'll be told that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of h of x is uh, 4. And then you'll be told that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of uh, p of x, let's say, is, um, uh, I don't know, 13. Okay? And then this is what you'll see. You'll be asked, hey, what is, let me make sure, look at my notes here. I want to make sure that I don't, that I don't get this wrong. Yeah. You'll be given this. You'll, they'll say, hey, what is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of, uh, of 21, right? And you're like, what in the world is this? I see all these f of x's and h of x's crazy stuff, and you throw a 21 here. Remember, this is the constant property, right? The constant property of limits. So 21 is a constant function. So the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 21 is 21, right? If you don't see any x's in here at all, it's constant, and the limit is going to be just that number, okay? All right, so then they'll say, hey, what's the limit as x approaches 2 of, um, let's say, 5, they'll say 5 times p of x, of 5 times p of x, right? Well, this is the scalar property. All you have to do is take the limit as x approaches negative 2 of p of x and then multiply it by 5. And the limit as x approaches negative 2 of p of x is given right here. That's 13. So 13 times 5, so this is just 5 times 13, which is going to be 65. There we go. That was easy. Okay. Let me see what else I have here. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Let's try that one. You might have, well, what is the limit? as x approaches negative 2 of um, g of x squared, of g of x squared. Well, the limit of the square of the function is the same as the square of the limit. So all we have to do is find the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x which is negative 7, and then square negative 7. Now be careful. Remember, you're, you're doing negative 7 times negative 7. Lots of people, I've seen so many people, if they're going to do it in a calculator, they'll type in negative 7 squared, and the calculator will tell them negative 49 because they did not put the negative 7 in parentheses. Okay? Now, I'm not saying you're going to use a calculator for this. I'm just saying, depending on your circumstance, be careful how you use the calculator. All right, so here, negative 7 squared, that's negative 7 times negative 7. That's positive 49. See what we're doing here? Isn't this easy? You're already given all your limits here. You don't even have to calculate a limit. All you're doing is applying the, um, is applying the uh, property. Okay? Let's say uh, we have the limit as x approaches negative 2 of... Uh, f of x over h of x minus 4, okay? Over h of x minus 4, okay? Now remember, so the limit of a quotient is equal to the limit of the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator. Now that's assuming that the denominator does not equal 0. Well, watch this. We know that the limit of the numerator, the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x, well, that's 9, right? And the limit as x approaches negative 2 of h of x, and notice I'm also combining in here. I'm putting in here the sum and difference rule, and I'm also throwing in the constant rule by having the 4 here. Okay, so there's a bunch of stuff going on here. But the limit as x approaches negative 2 of h of x is 4. And 4 minus 4 is 0. Therefore, we're not allowed to do this. This is not possible. This results, so this is not equals to, 
basically what we're just saying is that the result is 9 over 0. 9 over 0 means an, a, an infinite discontinuity, a vertical asymptote, which means no limit. So here we would say no, no limit, right? Because anytime we have not 0 over 0, we have no limit, OK? Let's do just a couple more examples here. Let's say, uh, what is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of the square root of uh, f of x? Okay. Well, the limit of a radical of a function is the same as the radical of the limit of the function. So this is simply going to be the square root of the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x which we look up here and we see that it's 9. So really it's just the square root of 9, so the answer is 3. Okay? All right, so that is the, the radical property of limits. Okay? So let's say we had, well, what is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x plus g of x minus p of x? Why don't you try that one right now? Morning. That's okay. No big deal. How are you, Rainer? Can you shut that door after you go through? Thank you. What's that? No, no, just the door. If you can shut, shut, off, shut the door after you go through. All right, so all you really have to do here is just take the limit of f of x, then the limit of g of x, then the limit of p of x, and then, so the limit of f of x is 9, plus the limit of g of x is negative 7, and then the limit of p of x is 13, so minus 13. I've kind of thrown the summation and the subtraction thing in here. And so 9 plus negative 7, well, that's 2. And 2 minus 13, that's negative 11. So we've got negative 11, OK? So I think that's pretty much it. I think you're, you're going to be good here. Uh, just you have to be able to apply all these properties to these uh, when you're given already some limits and um, that's pretty much all you're doing today uh, if you have any questions let me know and i'll see you in the next video